Okay, we're going to be uh, book of James. We're still chapter one. So if you'll take your Bibles and go to James chapter one, and we have some Bibles as the ushers come down uh, the aisles with Bibles in hand, just raise a hand if you'd like to receive one. James chapter one is where we're going to be. And uh, it's page 1184 in uh, those church Bibles that the ushers are handing out. James chapter one and page 1184 in those church Bibles. So while you're turning there, let me just uh, give us a, uh, a head start here, and then we'll, we'll uh, read a little bit from uh, where we left off at verse 21 of chapter 1, and then we'll pray and dig out these verses together, and hopefully maybe even into chapter 2 tonight as well. Uh, for those of you who might be new to the book of James, this, uh, this is a book that has five main themes to it, uh, trials and temptations. Those are kind of, you know, joint things that often go together, so that's why it's one instead of two. And then number two is faith and deeds, because there's this relationship between faith and works in, in the Christian life, and so James talks about that. He spends some time talking about speech, the tongue, and he spends some time talking about wisdom, and finally he talks about prayer. So we are making our way through the first topic, which is trials and temptations. The first part of chapter one dealt mainly with trials, and the second part of chapter one deals mainly with temptations. And we talked last week about how uh, three main points related to temptations. Number one, everyone faces temptation, right? Right? All right, thank you. Just wanna make sure I'm not alone. Uh, number two, God is not the source of temptation though. We've settled that. James says that he doesn't tempt, God doesn't tempt anyone. And number three, temptation is progressive towards death. You know, that's the ultimate demise of where temptation leads if we give in to it. Temptation itself is not sin, but it becomes progressive in that what starts with temptation, if we act on it, becomes sin. If we don't repent from it, it ultimately kills us. So that's the progressive nature of temptation. And then James doesn't leave us hanging, though, to say, well, you're all going to be tempted. It's progressive. It leads to death, and God doesn't tempt you. Good luck. What he ends up saying here at the end of chapter 1 is there is a source of help when we are tempted. And he's going to talk about the Bible. He's going to say the Word of God is powerful and effective to help us in our struggles against Sin. So this is where we left off at verse 21 of chapter 1. So I'm just going to read through to the end of the chapter, then we'll come back and, and take a look at this. So chapter 1 of James, verse 21, he says, Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and IV says evil that is so prevalent, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, of, of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unsported, unspotted rather, and IB says unpolluted from the world. Let's pause there and pray. Father, we thank you for this time together now as we open up the book of James and as we look into your word, we pray that you would use it to speak to our hearts. Help us to be open vessels for your work tonight, Lord, in our lives. And we love you and we praise you together in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. So when we look here into... Um, chapters 1 and uh, hopefully into uh, chapter 2 tonight, um, he spends some time talking about how Scripture is going to be the useful tool that God has put at our disposal for helping us to fight our battles of temptation. And he starts out here in verse 21 telling us, lay aside all this filthiness, 
The, you know, 1 John 2.16 talks about the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. All sin basically enters through one of those three doors. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, 1 John 2.16. So we're to lay aside all filthiness and, and all the overflow of wickedness in our lives. And we're to receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Now, right down in the margin of your Bible there, Romans 10, 17, where Paul reminds us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The reason why we place such strong emphasis on the Bible around here at Cornerstone, whether it's in the main service or children's classrooms or young adults or high school or middle school teens, uh, the reason why we put such strong emphasis on the Word of God in all areas of the ministry of Cornerstone is because we know that the Word of God is powerful and effective to change human lives. And that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And that as we hear God's Word, as we, as we receive God's Word, it has this powerful, effective purpose of working out God's ultimate plan for our lives, beginning with and primarily for the cause of salvation. That's why Paul writes there in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. It's, it's that first encounter with the Word of God that just reaches our hearts and begins to bring conviction and revelation and then ultimately then hopefully confession and repentance and then we turn to God and it's all triggered because of the Word of God. So that's why we're unapologetic around here from men's ministry to women's ministry to, young adults, youth, children, from, from the womb to the tomb, we are going to introduce you to the Word of God. And this is the emphasis that James places on the importance of God's Word. But he adds here that it's not enough to just hear it. He said, if, if you're just hearing it, you're deceiving yourself. He said, it's like, it's like somebody looks in a mirror, walks away, forgets what his or her face looks like. It's of no effect to you if you simply hear it, but don't apply it to your lives. And so that's, that's the main emphasis here. Deception of information comes when we just hear, but we don't apply. That's why he emphasizes here being doers uh, of the Word. And between verses 22 and 25, I just underline in my Bible the word uh, doer uh, three times, the word does once. And so the emphasis, again, is not on simply being hearers, but on doing what God's Word says. And, and, and thus, the Word of God is powerful and effective in our lives. There are different places in Scripture that the Bible speaks about itself as having various uh, benefits uh, in our lives. Uh, for example, uh, the Bible is like a double-edged sword that cuts me open and convicts me. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so there are times when you can just take God's word, you can just sit alone with the Lord and you just open up the Bible and it, it serves to be like a scalpel, like a double-edged sword, where God will use it to just kind of cut us open and do His surgery in our lives. It's also like a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path that guides me. Many of you are familiar with Psalm 119 verse 105, which says just that, that your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And the idea there in Psalm 119 is that it is useful both in the near for my feet, and for the distance, for my path. And so, you know, there are times that we need wisdom from God just for today. And there are times we need wisdom from God for next year. And so it's the feet and the path where God's Word, when we just start to read it and meditate on it, and we, and we draw near to God through the pages of Scripture, and how we then receive His insight and His counsel and His 
wisdom and his revelation from scripture that helps us both in the near term and in the long term. So it's important as a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path that guides me. The Bible is also like a fire that refines me and a hammer that breaks up the hard places of my heart. Jeremiah wrote like this in Jeremiah 23, 29, when he quotes the Lord and he says, is not my word like a fire, says the Lord and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. And so sometimes God's word has that refining effect, like a fire, where it, you, know, you start to read scripture and, and God just begins to refine you and turn up the heat and, you know, and just like a purifying effect of fire in our lives, like, like in the purification of the process of of making metals pure, how the fire, the intensity of the fire begins to, you know, raise the impurities to the surface and they get skimmed off so that metal can be more pure. And so God's word sometimes has a purifying effect and like fire and, uh, and, and like a hammer, Jeremiah says there, that just kind of, you know, God once in a while just needs to clobber us with his word and to break up those hard places of my heart. The Bible is also like water that washes away the impurities of my heart. In Ephesians 5, 25 to 26, Paul writes to husbands and he says, husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. So Paul uses this analogy of how the love of a husband for a wife is like the love of Christ for the church. And one of the things that God uses to help purify us is to wash over our hearts with his word. And then the last thing I'll just point out about the effect of God's word is the Bible is like pure spiritual milk that nourishes me and helps me to grow. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, Peter writes, as newborn babes, we are to desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And so God's word nourishes us and feeds us. So it's important, folks, that we get into God's word, that we don't just come to church and hear it, that we put it into practice. It's a dangerous thing to hear the word of God and do nothing with it. It's interesting because in 2 Peter 2.21, Peter writes about how it's better for them never to have known than to have known the way and to turn their backs on it. That there seems to be in God's economy of things greater grace for ignorance certainly than for arrogance. And it's an arrogant thing to hear the word of God and to do nothing with it. And so we must be doers of God's word and not hearers only. And he says to us straight up there in verse 25 that if we look into the perfect law of liberty and continue in it and not forgetful of what we hear, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. I mean, how much better can he get than that? God says, all right, listen, I want you to hear my word and be a doer. I don't want you to just be a hearer and not a doer. And by the way, when you do what you hear, you'll be blessed for it. I mean, how can it get any better than that? God just says flat out here, you'll be blessed if you do what it says. You know, it's very similar. Uh, you don't need to turn there, but uh, in Matthew chapter 7, when Jesus was uh, finishing up the Sermon on the Mount, if you have a red letter edition of the Bible, uh, in your Bibles, almost all of chapters 5, 6, and 7 are read because it's the longest recorded sermon that Jesus taught. And he concludes the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, verses 24 to 27, by saying something very similar to what James says there about, hear the word of God and do what it says and you'll be blessed. Listen to what Jesus said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, 24. He says, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. So very similar language. Jesus concludes the whole Sermon on the Mount by saying, 
If you hear what I'm saying and you do it, your life will be established on, on a firm foundation. It's like building your house upon a rock. But if you hear these words of mine and don't do what I'm saying to you, it's like building your house on a sand and the winds are gonna come and the storms of life are gonna hit, but you have no foundation. So it'll do you no good if you simply hear, but don't obey. You hear, but you don't put it into practice. So back here in James chapter one, this is the very thing that James is telling us to be about. Hear the word of God and apply it to your lives. Do what it says and you'll be blessed for it. Now, back here in chapter one of James verse 26, he says, if anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue. So again, there are different places where James talks about speech and he, and he talks about, you know, bridling the tongue. Here's one example of it, like a horse's bridle. You know, you, we gotta rein it in. Uh, and again, I quoted this last week, but Psalm 141 verse three, where David says, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth, keep watch over the door of my lips, amen. And James is gonna spend a whole nother part of chapter three talking about the tongue, so he's not done here. But it's interesting because he says, listen, you can have all this God speak all you want, but if you don't tame the tongue, he says, if you don't bridle your tongue, you deceive your own heart and one's religion is useless. So don't, don't mess up your testimony by the way you talk, right? Don't, and by the way, it's not just verbal communication these days. It's all kinds of ways that people communicate. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. I, I've had people say to me, listen, they've shown me people's social media and they're like, how come this person says that they're a Christian, but yet look at their social media. It's another form of speech. It's another form of communication. Be very careful what you put out there because if it's inconsistent with what you say you believe, then you have just uh, basically tainted your testimony by speech that is inconsistent with what you believe. And this is, this, it should go hand in hand. A lot of what James is gonna teach us here is this. If you're really a Christian, it should be obvious by the way that you act, by the deeds that you do, by the way that you talk, uh, by, by, by the way that you uh, love other people, there will be evidence to your faith by the way that you act and behave. And speech is just one part of it that he's touching on throughout the whole uh, book of James here. But he says, don't, don't deceive yourselves and don't make your religion useless by an unbridled tongue. Rein it in and guard your speech like you guard anything else in your life. And then he adds here in verse 27, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. And he talks about orphans and widows. And he says, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. And there's a special place in the heart of God for orphans and widows. And there should be a special place in our heart too. Uh, in Psalm 68 verse five, it says, a father to the fatherless and a defender of widows in, is God in his holy habitation. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. Several years ago, I, I joined a group from our church. We went down to Honduras and, uh, uh, on a mission trip, and one of the places we stopped was an orphanage. And, um, you know, we spent time with the kids and, you know, just loving on them and playing with them. And, and then when we left, we weren't told this going into it, uh, probably because they knew our emotional reaction would be different, um, and they just wanted us to act normal and to be around all these kids, but after we left the orphanage, we were told that every single one of those kids had AIDS, had HIV, every single one was HIV positive. Um, asymptomatic, but a HIV positive. And it was just crushing. I'm glad they told us after and not ahead of time, because you know, barring a miracle, um, all those kids in, in a matter of a few years may likely die. And um, man, God has a special place in his heart for orphans. And God bless those of you who have opened your hearts and your homes uh, to orphans and uh, adopted people who, uh, children who didn't have 
a mom or a dad. Um, of course, everybody has a biological mom or dad, but you know, biology doesn't necessarily make a mother. And biology doesn't necessarily make a father. It's, it's a heart that makes a mom or a dad. And, um, and God has a special place in his heart for orphans and for widows. Don't forget the elderly. And, um, and not every widow is necessarily elder either. Um, obviously, you can be widowed at any time in life. And we have to remember those who are alone. Orphans and widows are alone. And God is a father of the fathers and a defender of widows. And we need to have a special place in our hearts for them as well. And to show it. Because this is all part of just putting our faith into action. So he ends chapter 1 here on that note. And then into chapter 2, James is going to cover two great themes. The first is, don't show favoritism. The second is, do put faith into action. That's really what chapter 2 is all about. So let me, let me read a little bit here from chapter 2, starting at verse 1 down through verse 9, then we'll come back and start looking at these two great subjects here. But he says in verse 1, my brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Circle that word. Some of your translations will say favoritism. For, there, for if there should come into your assembly, and by the way, that word assembly in the original Greek is synagogue. So it's interesting because James is written to Jewish believers scattered throughout Asia Minor. So we have here an indication of how a synagogue was not exclusive to Jews um, alone. These are also Jewish believers who are occupying the synagogue. So he says, For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and say to him, You sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, You stand there, or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, he says, my, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Uh, do they not blaspheme uh, that noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. All right, so we'll pause there because this first thing that he's dealing with here is favoritism. And uh, he's pointing out the fact that, hey, uh, even in the church, Unfortunately, Christians can be guilty of showing favoritism. And he starts out here in verse 1 by saying, don't. Don't show favoritism. Again, New King James and ESV and King James uses the word partiality, but that's what he's talking about. Don't show favoritism. And we can tend to get impressed uh, by people based on um, what they're wearing or what they're driving or how many letters are after their name. Um, um, how, how, how good-looking they are. I, I was reading an interesting study. Uh, it was a book actually written by Daniel Hammermesh called Beauty Pays, Why Attractive People Are More Successful. And this just speaks to the fact of how people show favoritism. Because according to the study, listen to this, studies show attractive students get more attention and higher evaluations from their teachers Good-looking patients get more personalized care from their doctors. Handsome criminals receive lighter sentences than less attractive criminals. And good-looking people make 11 to 15 percent more than unattractive people. Isn't this amazing? I mean, how do you think I got this gig? But anyway, <laughs> not true. But I'm just pointing out, according to these studies, that we can have certain prejudices and biases towards the way people look and how they're dressed. This is the kind of thing that James is talking about. He says, he says, you know, consider this. Somebody walks into the fellowship, they're really, you know, they're dressed to the nines, and you give them a special seat, but somebody else who hasn't bathed in a week, they look homeless, and, and you, you're going to put them in some, you know, corner of, of the sanctuary. I mean, how 
how ungodly is that treatment of, of people? And so he says, don't do that kind of thing. Don't show favoritism. Don't show partiality here. And he, he says that it's a sin. He, he says in verse 8, if you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He says, great, you do well. And he's quoting from, from the Old Testament law, Leviticus 19, 18, love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, Jesus, by the way, raised that standard in John's gospel when he says, um, um, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this will all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So we are to love one another as he has loved us, not just love one another as we love ourselves. Under the old covenant, self was the highest standard. Under the new covenant, God is the highest standard. I mean, he's always the highest, but it was reduced in the Old Testament, uh, Old Covenant standard to mankind and how he can work his way, you know, and how, and how his um, deeds of righteousness can uh, prove his faith. But in the New Testament, you come to the New Testament, you're like, okay, Jesus is like, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this will all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. But James goes on here to say, if you show partiality, Notice that in verse, in verse 8, uh, uh, rather verse 9, he says, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. There are three reasons why favoritism is a sin. For you note takers, here's the first one. Number one, it is inconsistent with God's nature. He says there again in verse uh, one, he says, my brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. You see, God doesn't show favoritism. It is contrary to his nature. So when we do it, we are acting in opposition to the character and nature of our Lord. In fact, in Romans 2.11, Paul simply says, God does not show favoritism. And there's this occasion in Acts chapter 10, remember when Peter had to get beyond his own bias as a Jew towards Gentiles by being obedient to the Lord and going to the house of Cornelius, who was a Gentile, and preaching the gospel. Peter goes, albeit somewhat reluctantly, but he goes because he's a kosher Jew. He doesn't go into the home of a Gentile. So God tells him, I want you to go. He shares the good news of the message of, of Christ. He preaches the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Cornelius and his whole family get saved. And then Peter will testify in Acts 10 verses 34 and 35. Then he begins to say, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism but accepts men from all nations who fear God and do what is right. So Peter comes to this realization. He, he had been ingrained with the idea that as a Jew, he, was, he had special status with God. And in the sense of the plan of redemption coming through a Jewish Messiah, through a Jewish race, yes, but not in the sense that the Jewish people were the only people who could be redeemed, that Jesus Christ came for all, to die for all, as many as would turn to him to be saved. And so Peter had to actually work through some of his own bias, some of his own prejudice towards Gentiles. And when he sees Cornelius and his family get saved, first Gentile converts in the New Testament, he says, I now realize God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from all nations who fear him and do what is right. And so if we show favoritism, it is inconsistent with God's nature. The second thing is, it is inconsiderate of others themselves. In verses three and four here of, of James two, he says, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and you say to him, you sit here in a good place and you say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges? Where does prejudice come from? Prejudging. You've judged someone. You've shown prejudice with evil thoughts. That's the word that's used there in verse 4. He says, this is actually evil. This is evil. And this is inconsiderate of others. Favoritism only shows not only how we pander to people, but it also reveals hidden discrimination against others. This is why it's wrong. There was a study done by Cornell University published uh, 
in the Journal of Marriage and Family that found that siblings, just think about favoritism within a household, siblings who sensed that a parent consistently favored or rejected one child over others were more likely to show depressive symptoms as middle-aged adults. You as a kid feel like mom or dad loved sibling a lot more. It was obvious. It wasn't just perceived. It was real. It was obvious. Those people who felt rejected because of the favoritism shown towards another sibling in general tended to grow up and have depressive symptoms even in adulthood. The discrimination and rejection that comes at the other end of favoritism can be damaging. The root of discrimination is pride. It's the sense that you or someone else is better than another, and it is inconsiderate of other people. And then thirdly, it is incompatible with the law of love. This is what he says here in verses 8 and 9. He says, if you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well, but if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. And so what he's saying here is, basically, God's not impressed with somebody's net worth. God's not impressed with the way that somebody dresses. God's not impressed with their education or their appearance. None of that matters to God. God evaluates a person's worth purely on the basis of the equal value that he has attached to every life. And how much is that of inestimable worth? God has attached equal value of inestimable worth unto every human being because he didn't die for a select few. He died for all because God so loved a select few? No, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that's the way we need to see each other, as having inestimable worth in the eyes of God, so much so that God was willing to die for every single human being. There are two little tiny parables back to back in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, one is the parable of the hidden treasure, and one is the parable of the pearl of great price. And I'm going to, it's only two verses. Each, each parable is one verse. I'm going to read these two verses to you, and I, and I want to put what I think is um, a different slant on, on the way these parables are commonly taught. So this is what it says out of Matthew 13, 44 to 46. Again, the kingdom of God, Jesus speaking here, again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Okay, that's the first parable. That's the parable of the hidden treasure. And then the parable of the pearl of great price, he says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all he had and bought it. Now, I will tell you the majority of the ways that those parables are taught is this that the treasure in the field and the pearl of great price is Jesus, and that we need to find him and then give up everything we have to get him. That's the way that those two parables are commonly taught, and how Jesus is the treasure in the field and Jesus is the pearl of great price. And there, and there are songs written about this. Um, I just don't think that that's the right interpretation. You're free to interpret it that way, and you're free to be wrong. But I think that there's a different way, and I'm going to give you the biblical basis for it. First, is it more scripturally consistent to say that I found Jesus or Jesus found me? Jesus found me. I was dead in my transgressions and sin. I wasn't even looking for Jesus. And he pursued me. That's the end of Psalm 23. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Follow me is actually in the Hebrew a military term that means to pursue. God's mercy pursues us to the end of the earth because God goes after us. 
because God is the pursuer. He is the initiator. He is the one who goes after us. We are the responders. I was lost, but now I'm found, all right? So Jesus is the one, okay, who finds us. I didn't find him. The other thing that's important to recognize in those two parables that is similar is that in both cases, somebody, whether it was the one who stumbled upon the treasure in the field or whether it was the merchant who comes across this pearl, forfeits everything that they have to purchase this thing of great worth. Okay, now, seriously, what did you have to give up to get Jesus? What did you get? Compared to what he gave up for you, by dying on a cross, by shedding his blood, to purchase you from sin and death, to purchase me from sin and death, he's the one who gave up everything to come after us, okay? In comparison to what he has done for me, I've given up nothing. I've given up nothing. So, I believe, again, different commentaries are going to disagree with me on this, but I believe that Jesus is teaching those parables to help us to understand the value that you are in his eyes. And that though there is nothing within ourselves that is righteous, yet he loved us so much because he sees the inestimable worth of your life that you were worth dying for. And thus, you are that treasure hidden in the field, and you are that pearl of great price that Jesus shed his blood to purchase so that you might understand your worth and your value in the eyes of the Savior who died on a cross to purchase you and me from sin and death. You are that treasure in the field. You are that pearl of great price. That is taking nothing away from Christ, okay? That is not in any way to diminish the value of Christ, all right? It is simply to say, who was the one that really purchased whom? Who was the one who really found whom? And in those parables, I think it's his, him saying to us, you were worth dying for. I gave my life. God in heaven saying, I sacrificed my son to go after you, that we might be redeemed as the treasure that he pursued to win us, to buy us, to gain us, for himself. And so we'll end it there for tonight. Uh, our time has escaped us and uh, we'll pick it up there. Uh, not next time because I'm going to be in Israel, but uh, you're going to be in good hands. Uh, Austin Jr. over here, he's going to be filling for me next Wednesday night. And uh, yeah, yeah, Austin, yeah. We're looking forward to that. Uh, but you can be praying for the team that's going to be for the, the team. It's not really like we're going on a mission trip. Uh, we're not really suffering, but we're going to go over there and, and uh, walk where Jesus walks. So you can be praying for us uh, coming up this week. But when I get back, we'll pick it up there where we left off so you can have plenty of time to read ahead and finish up the book of James if you haven't already. Let's pause and pray. Lord, thank you for this time together in your word tonight. Thank you that you went to such great lengths to go after us to purchase us, the value that you see in each of us worth dying for. We know, Lord, that nothing in ourselves is good, nothing in ourselves is righteous, but you looked upon humanity and you said they're worth dying for. And we thank you, Lord. And we pray that we would be people who would walk in your grace and not show favoritism and not be prejudiced and not have pride towards others, but to see people as you see them. Everybody was worth dying for. May we share your heart in loving people, in honoring people, in valuing people from the womb to the tomb Every life and every human being is precious to you, Lord. May we share that. May we share that value, the same that you have for others. May we share that, Lord.
And we thank you for this time in your word together tonight. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.